In the mid 80s, Guns N' Roses crawled out of the hotbed of decadence to release a landmark album while facing the constant threat of implosion, a ban at retail, a ban at MTV, and slow record sales. The transfixing evolution of the biggest selling debut album of all time, Appetite for Destruction, next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to subscribe right now. Click the bell so you never miss out on our daily content. Also, hit us up on Patreon for even more videos. Um, you'll have to excuse me. I'm a little sick. I've actually got COVID, so I might cough. But what better way to lip the spirit than to talk about one of the greatest albums of all time? You know, in the 80s, the Sunset Strip of Hollywood, California was a vibrant epicenter of live music. Once described as a cheerfully depraved Aquanet playground, on the weekends, there was a constant traffic jam of teenagers you know, cruising up and down the 1.7 miles of crowds and clubs. The sidewalks were filled with big hair, stilettos, uh, and leather, along with hustlers, prostitutes, open containers, and brazen drug use. Legendary venues like Gazzari's, uh, the Whiskey, the Roxy, the Rainbow, and the Viper Room, uh, they were the breeding ground where up-and-coming rock bands would cut their teeth, hoping to get noticed by a record label, our big time artist manager, man, those were the days. Motley Crue, Jane's Addiction, Wasp, and LA Guns and Poison. They were just some of the bands that broke out of the glam rock and hair band scene of the 80s Sunset Strip and went on to national prominence. Perhaps the most interesting and prodigious breakout of the Sunset Strip was the rise of Guns N' Roses and their debut LP, Appetite for Destruction. That would become the biggest selling debut album of all time, unseating Boston's debut actually. Uh, GNR was a fixture on the strip and had a bit of a rivalry with Jane's Addiction, as Perry Farrell would relate in my interview with him. Guns N' Roses were comprised of lead vocalist Axl Rose, who also played synthesizer and added percussion, Izzy Stradlin, uh, rhythm guitar and backing vocals, Duff McKagan on bass and backing vocals, Steven Adler on drums, and London-born Saul Hudson, who developed notoriety on the scene with his one-word stage name, Slash. Not every music industry scout, though, was uh, impressed with GNR. Some thought of them as just another garage band. But there was one big exception, Tom Zutat. The A&R man that signed Motley Crue in 82 uh, was working for Geffen Records when he saw GNR perform at the Troubadour in West Hollywood. And after the second song in the band set, he was convinced that they had enormous potential. Uh, he saw them as the counterpoint to the hair metal scene of Hollywood. Zutat predicted that GNR was going to be the biggest band in the world. And he put his reputation on the line when he told his boss, <coughs> uh, David Geffen, that they were going to be bigger than Led Zeppelin. Zutat was uh, particularly blown away by the incredible ability of GNR lead guitar Slash, who was only 19 on the night, uh, that night in the Troubadour. At only 19, though, Zutat believed Slash could give Jimmy Page a run for his money, as he would say, and he was equally awestruck by the power and magnetism of GNR's intrepid frontman, Axel Rose. Of course, Axel had a, a snake-like movement on stage that reminded Zutat of uh, Jim Morrison, the late Danny Sugarman, who managed Morrison and The Doors and co-authored the icon's biography, No One Here Gets Out Alive, often compared Axel to Jim Morrison. Zutat stated, that had the rest of the band uh, just completely sucked, he would have signed Axl Rose to a solo deal. Zutat put his butt on the line and asked Geffen to give him a $75,000 advance to sign GNR within 72 hours uh, after seeing them at the Troubadour. Construction began for creating the legendary debut GNR album, Appetite for Destruction, with the myriad challenges facing Zutat. Most pressing was the tenuous stability of the band. Zutat had to babysit the five band members around the clock. Uh, four of the band members lived in impoverished digs called Hell House, surrounded by heavy partying and uh, constant chaos. While Axel stayed in a room that uh, he kept in pristine condition, uh, protected by a padlock, avoiding the bedlam, and was as sober as a priest. The GNR mayhem somehow worked, though, and was the perfect storm recipe for a dangerous album that captured the subversive foundation of the band. Izzy was the idea man, 
According to Zutat, he was the primary creator of the Appetite for Destruction sound. Uh, Duff's complex uh, bass parts were played like a lead guitarist, and he had an obvious punk rebelliousness. Adler gave GNR a disco punk quality with a dance swing. Zutat called Steven's drumming style Disco Boy Puppy Dog. Uh, Slash's guitar riffs were the hammer that knocked the nail in for the unbridled sonic power of GNR. while every word and nuance of an arrangement had Axel's fingerprints all over it. Axel was GNR's quality control, if you will. Zutat and the band were very selective about choosing the right person to produce Appetite. Their main priority was ensuring that the record was not slick or overproduced. I mean, this was the 80s. They looked at five producers and ultimately chose Mike Klink largely because of his work as an engineer on UFO Strangers in the Night, an album that the band actually worshipped. Zutat knew that Klink understood how to capture a band on tape, which meant he would uh, get a great performance out of GNR. So when the recording sessions began, Zutat stepped up his role as babysitter, making certain that the sessions captured GNR's uh, electricity and did his best to keep the band totally focused. Zutat had his work cut out for him, though. Duff's drinking was out of hand, uh, Izzy was on smack, and Axel battled his uh, cerebral demons that straddled genius and insanity. And there was the band's infamous unpredictability and tardiness. When you were lucky enough to get uh, all five members together and ready to record, you needed to seize the moment immediately. To do that, Zutat did something unprecedented when he secured a private purchase order book so that he had the autonomy to uh, reserve studio time at any hour, even if it was in the middle of the night. Really genius, actually. Zutat put Clink on a red alert as well, making sure that he was ready to uh, race into the studio at a moment's notice. When the recording for Appetite for Destruction was completed, the GNR team had created what Zutat held as the last great hard rock record, made entirely by hand. Uh, there was no computer assistance or automated faders on the record. Zero. It's a piece of imperfect art that will stand the test of time because it was made manually on a console. It captured the, the proverbial lightning in a bottle, but it took over a year after Geffen unleashed the record for the lightning to strike. Uh, the next hurdle facing the release of Appetite for Destruction was the controversial art of the original album cover. Let's talk about that. One day, Axel showed... Tom Zutat a card with a Robert Williams painting and told Zutat, you realize that this is the future. Uh, then Rose pointed to the woman in the painting, adding, this is the victim, this is the media, and above them is the monster that the media creates. Axel prophetically predicted at that moment in 1986 that we were gonna live in a world of fake news where society would feed off of tragedy the Williams painting depicted human nature uh, and the ugly appetite we have for destruction. Axel told Zutat that uh, CNN was going to change the world by feeding that appetite. He saw the future in the painting by Williams, an underground outlaw artist who created the image in 1978 and titled it Appetite for Destruction well before Axel and the band discovered its existence. Everyone in the GNR circles, including Robert Williams, knew that uh, the art would be too shocking for mainstream consumption, uh, especially as album art sold in retail stores at shopping malls. But of course, GNR, um, they actually had 100% creative control in their contract so they could use whatever art that they wanted. After working out a fee to license the art with Williams, GNR titled the album and uh, used the painting for the cover of their debut LP, Appetite for Destruction, released in 1987. The cover stirred up a me backlash, and of course, retail refused to carry the album. In response, Geffen prepared a Tamer Cross and Skull illustrated cover option, with Williams' painting relegated to the centerfold of the liner notes. The five skulls on the revised cover represented each of the five band members of GNR. After the ban was lifted on selling the album, the radio promotion began for the latent masterpiece. The record label chose It's So Easy as the first single, a song that was uh, co-penned by Duff McKagan and the late West Arkeen. 
The track was selected as the lead single specifically as a UK strategy. It's all easy, easy. Welcome to the Jungle was released uh, next as the second single and its momentum was abruptly thwarted when MTV refused to play the music video. Uh, half of MTV's cable outlets at that time were owned by ultra right wing conservative John Malone, who told MTV's founder Bob Pittman if his network played dangerous junkie bands, he would remove MTV from all of his cable affiliates. So weird. Nine months after its release, Appetite for Destruction was shockingly viewed as a failure by Geffen Records. The record had moved only 200,000 copies, which uh, was an underwhelming number that frankly any rock band during that era could have sold. Geffen CEO Ed Rosenblatt called Tom Zutat into his office and he declared the record dead. Dead. Very hard to believe indeed. In order to change the course of history, Zutat again had to put his head in the guillotine. Zutat went over Rosenblatt's head to the main man at the label, David Geffen, and begged him to use his close personal relationship with Bob Pittman and ask him for a favor. Geffen manifested his power in the industry by getting Pittman to grant that favor. And MTV played the video for Welcome to the Jungle at 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. playing the video really at the worst possible viewing time, it didn't matter. Later the same morning, that same morning, MTV aired Welcome to the Jungle, the video. The phones at Zutat's office blew up with calls. After only one play of the video, MTV switchboards were lit up with people enthusiastically requesting the video. How could they not? Rosenblatt turned his gloom and doom declaration for appetite for destruction into a hysterical glee when MTV announced that they were adding the video of Welcome to the Jungle after only one play. Zutat's vindication was well on its way, fueled by the heavy rotation exposure on MTV. Welcome to the Jungle shot to uh, number seven, yeah, on the Billboard Hot 100, and it went to number 26 in the UK. As we go into the song breakdowns from Appetite, <coughs> I wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, of the glasses I have on all the time. Go do a virtual 3D try-on at zenny.com today. Now, the lyrics for Welcome to the Jungle were written by Axl Rose. In an interview with Spin Magazine in 1999, Axl claimed the inspiration for the song's lyrics came from an encounter that he and a friend had with a homeless man while they were departing from a bus in New York City, trying to put a scare into the young runaways the homeless man yelled at them, you know where you are? You're in the jungle, baby. <laughs> You're gonna die. <laughs> I love that one. You're in the jungle, baby. You gonna die. Axel placed that line strategically in the song's bridge after Slash's haunting guitar solo. It's perhaps the, the climaxing moment of the track, Savage Realism. In his bio, Slash cites, uh, that Axel remembered a riff that Slash played in when they were living in uh, Slash's mother's basement. The riff was the foundation that the song was built from. With Slash coming up with new guitar parts to finish the arrangement, <laughs> Slash also credits Duff with the idea for the song's ominous breakdown. Love that part. Duff has a different memory of the song's origin in his autobiography, saying that the provenance for Welcome to the Jungle goes clear back to 1978 uh, and was a song titled The Fake that he wrote for a punk band that he was in at the time. It was called The Veins. Anyway, given the divisive nature of Guns N' Roses uh, that ultimately led to the breakup of the formative unit of GNR, uh, we're going to get conflicting stories from each member about virtually every track on Appetite for Destruction. Fittingly, VH1 named Welcome to the Jungle as the greatest hard rock song of all time on their list of the 100 greatest hard rock songs in 2009. The third single from Appetite for Destruction was Sweet Child of Mine, a track that Axl Rose wrote about uh, his then girlfriend model Erin Everly, uh, daughter of the Everly brothers, of one of the Everlys. Um, the tune skyrocketed to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, number six in the UK in 88. Now this is a song we will definitely break down even more in the future. It's such a classic of the popular music canon. 
Slash's renowned guitar riff that opened Sweet Child of Mine, it evolved from a string skipping exercise that Slash was playing during one of the band's jam sessions at the Hell House in Hollywood. I mean, Slash was basically joking around while he was playing a circus melody and making facial gestures uh, directed at Steven Adler. Izzy Stralin was the one who coaxed Slash to play the medley again, and he added some chords while uh, Duff McKagan worked in a bass line and Adler came up with a fusing beat. Slash's playful exercise quickly morphed into the melodic structure of GNR's huge number one smash, Sweet Child of Mine. In another passage of Slash's biography, there are some details of the genesis of Axel's classic, Where Do We Go, Where Do We Go Now, in Sweet Child of Mine. Sweet Child, where do we go now? The band was recording demos uh, with producer Spencer Proffer, and actually, Spencer Proffer is the one who produced Quiet Rights Mental Health, which was the first metal album to hit the top of the Billboard album chart. But Proffer suggested adding a breakdown for Sweet Child to set up the climactic outro of the song. And while trying to come up with lyrics for a breakdown, Axel began saying out loud, where do we go? Where do we go now? And Proffer snapped his fingers, prompting Axel to sing those exact words for the breakdown. Brilliant. Of course, it turned out to be very memorable and such an important, vital part of the orchestration. Slash's iconic solo was said to be inspired, actually he said it, uh, by the 70s classic song Baker Street by Jerry Rafferty, and you can definitely hear that tip of the hat. Now, although Sweet Child of Mine is uh, technically a love song, Calling it a power ballad would be an insult to the track's seizing power. Uh, then came Paradise City as the fourth single from Appetite, a driving anthemic rocker, if there ever was one, that the entire band developed while riding and playing in the back of a rental van while leaving a gig they performed in San Francisco. Paradise City was the third consecutive top 10 hit from Appetite surging to number five on the Billboard Hot 100. It went to number six in the UK and all the way to number one in Ireland. I mean, it's such a feel-good cruising rocker. I remember singing this to the top of my lungs to all my friends uh, when I was in the seventh grade. Home, yeah, yeah. The substance of the inspired music found on Appetite for Destruction, you know, it's much deeper than the three monster hit singles. I mean, tracks like Night Train, My Michelle, of course, Mr. Brownstone. I mean, they follow a serpentine of uh, hard-hitting, lurid adventurism. These are not songs about schmaltzy love and cliche romance. My Michelle, I mean, in particular, it's very dark, with Slash's guitar tones that create a, an atmosphere of tension and mystery. The story reveals of the sordid past of an old friend of Slash's in lyrics like, your daddy works in porno, now that mommy's not around, she used to love her heroin, but now she's underground. And of course, Mr. Brownstone uh, had that one part that I don't even need to say it out loud. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Pretty shocking to my 12 year old ears at the time. Needless to say, I rewound it uh, about a thousand times. And finally, yes, the notorious closing track, Rocket Queen. Uh, that features a provocative sounds from an in-studio tryst between Rose and an intermittent girlfriend of Adler, a fact that the drummer was pretty pissed off about. The song provides a fitting ending to the album though, with the uh, sexy gritty first half of the song contrasted with the softer ballad-like second half, uh, capturing the vibe of really the entire LP. <coughs> Appetite for Destruction was one of the last albums if not the last album, where rock and roll was dangerous and real with a budget for unbridled exposure. 
everybody from my generation has their own unique and special experience with this album. It was an album that reached you know, across the aisle to every demographic. All of them had appetite for destruction on record, CD, or cassette. I remember my dad took my copy of Appetite away from me because I was playing it too loud, you know? And the next day, I went out to his shop, which was right next to our house, because uh, my mom wanted me to call him in for dinner. And I found him rocking out to Paradise City. I mean, I was livid. He had taken my tape, but then I realized he didn't take away my Appetite tape because I was playing it too loud. He took it because he wanted to listen to it. All of a sudden, my dad was the coolest dad in the world. What other father was jamming to Axel and Slash? Not many in the small town that I lived in. Like I said, we all have our memories of this perfect album, and I definitely want to hear them in the comment section. Let's celebrate this, this touchstone of our youth. Now, Tom Zutat, the visionary music industry professional that uh, predicted and cultivated its colossal domination, put it best when he surmised that Appetite for Destruction was the last time major label record making was funded as an art form. That's why a new generation is fervently discovering Guns N' Roses and why the historic uh, impact of the biggest selling debut of all time has surpassed sales of more than 30 million units. How do I say this? Um, I would argue that my generation, Gen X, was the most fortunate group of all when it came to experiencing music real time. What I mean is that, uh, you know, our parents, sure, they had the Beatles. I get it. But in just 10 years, from 82 to 92, we had three universe-shaking moments by my count. Uh, Michael Jackson, when he released Thriller. Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction. and Nirvana smells like teen spirit. And not to mention other moments along the way that were right there, like the police synchronicity, uh, uh, Van Halen 1984, Prince Purple Rain, also incredible albums by The Smiths, The Cure, Depeche Mode, U2, R.E.M. Then of course, Madonna, Janet Jackson, Tina Turner, Whitney Houston. And there was Live Aid, Springsteen, Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, I could go on and on. I feel so sorry for the generation growing up now that, that can't experience that real time like we did. We were so fortunate. I mean, we had like four or five Beatles on Ed Sullivan moments. And the name of the album is appropriate because Guns N' Roses debut, uh, their debut record destroyed the competition in the late 80s and they destroy the competition now. By the way, this is just the first episode on this album. More is gonna follow, where I'm gonna talk about uh, this album with those who are actually in the room. Leave us a comment about this album, share your memories, tell us your stories. If you love the album like I do, you really should pick up the Appetite for Destruction Super Deluxe box set. I mean, it's got 25 unreleased tracks, amongst many other rarities, or you could really go crazy and get the locked and loaded box set that's only for hardcore fans. Anyway, you can see both of those at our Amazon links below. We also invite you to subscribe now. Be a part of our celebration of music. That's what we're all about. We'd love to have you. Also, check us out on Patreon to help curate the history of music. You guys are amazing. I always love doing this. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.